uh, n sigma v. Um, and uh, so that's the annihilation rate to the standard model. And we say that that process continues until that annihilation rate, the number density becomes small enough that that annihilation rate drops below the Hubble parameter. So what we do is to fix the observed dark matter density to what we see today. And that allows us to fix up to a logarithmic uh, dependence on the mass scale which is on the order of three times 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second. And then you can do uh, just a, a simple estimate of what you expect that annihilation uh, rate to be. And if you just do uh, a simple estimate for what you would expect for annihilation through, uh, let's say a Z boson, and the fact that the dark matter is just becoming non-relativistic, so its velocity is on the order of C on three, what you get is about 10 to the minus 24 centimeter cube per second. If I put this common mass scale, reduced mass of the dark matter with the target and Z boson mass at around 100 GeV. So, you know, just going back to what we had on the previous slide, you know, that's actually too large. And so that's what sets a natural mass scale for uh, dark matter around one TeV, if the coupling constants are weak coupling constants. So um, that immediately tells you that if you want to think about heavier dark matter, you know, well above the TeV scale, setting the abundance through the interactions with the standard model is challenging. Now there are exceptions. Uh, uh, if you make a general blanket statement like that, of course the theorists will look for exceptions. But in general, it's not, uh, it's not the uh, a primary motivation for looking for dark matter in this heavier mass window. On the other hand, uh, it's also clear uh, that this uh, argument for setting a mass scale for the dark matter uh, through its interactions via weak scale uh, forces motivates you to look for dark matter through those interactions just by the crossing symmetry. So if you have an annihilation process to standard model going through some heavy state, then you can use crossing symmetry to calculate, you know, an interaction and expected interaction rate for a scattering process. Um, and in fact, that's what's motivated these direct detection experiments. So here's the cross section, dark matter mass. Uh, interestingly, dark matter interacting via the Z boson uh, actually gives rise to an interaction cross-section, which is about 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared. And that's now ruled out by many orders of magnitude. So LZ and xenon one ton are experiments that are, you know, ongoing or being commissioned. And those reach down by, you know, seven, eight orders of magnitude below this Z boson, Z boson interaction rate. So what we're probing now is this Higgs interacting dark matter. On the other hand, you can see that the sensitivity of these experiments just bites the dust for dark matter with mass below about 10 GeV. And there's uh, reasons for that, which I will explain in just a bit. But I'd like to point out that those same simple EFT kinds of arguments uh, also motivate uh, looking for dark matter whose abundance is set by its interactions with the standard model at mass scales, which are just below the weak scale. I'd like to make a side comment, even though I'm not going to talk about it in detail, that um, in this lower mass window, uh, dark matter self interactions, if there is a force uh, that's at a lower mass scale, become uh, complex and astrophysically relevant. And that's again, just doing a back of the envelope for this interaction cross section through some uh, low scale force in the dark sector. 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared is at a scale where um, it could change galactic dark matter dynamics. And then in addition, the abundance of dark matter uh, can be set by its interactions with the standard model. And that's just noting that I can push this mass scale down quite naturally if I have modestly smaller couplings for the dark forces in the hidden sector, or if the coupling uh, to the standard model 
um, is smaller than weak scale coupling constants, which in general you expect if the model is kinetically mixed or uh, or other reasons why the coupling to the standard model would be smaller than the weak coupling constant just from direct constraints on those forces and on the dark sector, then you can quite naturally push this mass scale in the dark sector down. So what we're going to be showing on some of these plots is to, again, use that uh, crossing symmetry as a guide for interaction rates and direct detection. So if dark matter is produced via its interaction with the standard model uh, through annihilation to the standard model or uh, a freezing type process where E plus E minus annihilates to the dark matter, then you can use the crossing symmetry to make a prediction for how big of a direct detection uh, cross section you would expect. So um, the plots I'm gonna be showing now are going to start at one GeV. So they, they uh, pick up where uh, the WIMP experiments are, uh, are losing their sensitivity. And then on these plots, we'll show uh, bands that correspond to different production mechanisms by the interaction with the standard model. Uh, and I'm not gonna go in detail how you compute these curves just because of a lack of time. Uh, the thing that I wanna highlight is that if we step back, and we look at this uh, dark matter uh, panorama for uh, masses below the weak scale, nuclear recoil uh, very rapidly loses sensitivity. Uh, and there have been a series of experiments that have been uh, designed and in some cases are being already in R&D and have in some cases also results then now look at electron excitation. You need uh, electron volt energy resolution, whereas the nuclear recoil experiments typically have KEV energy resolution. And then uh, uh, as you go to even lower masses to get down to this uh, KEV uh, warm dark matter limit, you need more like milli EV energy resolution. And here is where uh, collective excitations in the form of phonons and magnons become really important. We initially focused on covering the mass regime, the three orders of magnitude um, from one MeV down to KeV, where electron excitation is no longer uh, effective um, as a probe. But it turns out that these collective excitations can actually probe this entire mass window from 1 keV up to 1 GeV. So you can get this entire window where the dark matter uh, is produced by its interactions with the standard model uh, with this uh, set of ideas that I'll talk about. And in addition, for every order of magnitude of mass that you get uh, from in dark matter mass through scattering, you get another order of magnitude uh, through uh, an absorption process. So where you take the mass energy instead of the kinetic energy. So this is not motivated typically by um, setting the abundance through the interactions with the standard model, uh, but it's something that comes along for free uh, in this setup. So let me talk now about the physics uh, that, that uh, leads us to go from nuclear recoil down to electron excitations and finally to collective excitations. So uh, the reason why uh, nuclear recoil is a good way to look for weak scale dark matter is because uh, nuclei are well kinematically matched to dark matter that has a mass scale around the weak scale. So the conceptual idea is extremely simple. You have a non-relativistic dark matter particle coming in, it interacts with a nucleus, those have mass on the, on, you know, on the same order of magnitude. Uh, and the energy deposited is just the momentum transfer squared over twice the nucleus mass. So as long as the uh, dark matter is on the same order or uh, heavier than the nucleus mass, then you can actually extract all of the dark matter kinetic energy in that process. Once the dark matter drops below the target nucleus mass, this becomes a kinematically um, inefficient process. It's just like trying to transfer energy to uh, a wall. It's not, a, it's not an effective um, energy transfer mechanism. So uh, the 
simplest thing that you can do next is just to consider lighter targets. Uh, and it's actually more complicated than that. I'm over, uh, uh, oversimplifying this. But the idea here is that uh, materials, of course, have not only nuclei, they have uh, electrons bound to them in various forms. So in insulators, you can try to ionize that electron. Uh, and a search has been done looking for sub-GEV dark matter uh, down to the 10 MeV mass scale, which is where uh, the dark matter carries enough energy to be able to ionize that uh, electron in xenon. Uh, or in semiconductors like germanium and silicon, where the electrons are more loosely bound, the conduction electrons are. And that allows you to get another order of magnitude down to one uh, MeV mass scale. So the, uh, as far as the reach in these experiments goes, um, obviously the density of states is very important. And unless you're in a metal, uh, these electrons do not have free dispersions and they're described by the band structure of the material. So as a particle physicist, it may have been a long time since you thought about uh, materials and their band structures. So, uh, so just to remind you, um, typically what happens in a crystal, so this is like the structure of silicon here and these, uh, points represent the location of the ions. And uh, so you can calculate the um, structure, band structure of electrons. And typically what you do is to pick out a momentum slice in one, uh, in one of these Brillouin zones. Uh, and then the letters denote the slice uh, in, the, uh, in, in momentum space. So that's what's shown on the x-axis. And then the energy, uh, here an electron volt is shown on the y-axis and the process is an excitation from an electron from the valence to the conduction band. So this is what uh, the calculations that compute, for example, this curve uh, with a total exposure here in this plot on silicon of 10 kilogram years. What they'll do is to take the wave functions of these uh, valence and conduction band electrons and compute the transition rate for this process. And that allows you to reach one MeV dark matter. You need smaller gap materials if you wanna access dark matter as light as the, uh, as the KeV warm dark matter limit. So the simplest example of a material that will allow you to do that is a superconductor. So a superconductor is a, a, a normal metal um, that is cooled and when it does, that there's a gap that opens up uh, in the uh, density of states. The gap is actually good from an experimental point of view because it, it quells uh, some of the thermal excitations in the material. And so then the idea there is to pick off one of these electrons in this quadratic uh, dispersion and excite it from the valence of the conduction band. Unfortunately, it's, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, from a theory point of view, it's interesting to note that uh, the, uh, the result is not quite that simple because the in medium effects have, are, are rather dramatic. Um, and in particular, it's not the plasma mass so much as the Thomas Fermi screening length that becomes very relevant for dramatically reducing your reach to um, dark matter interaction. Uh, rates. And this is not actually even through dark photon mediated dark matter, but also if dark matter interacts with the electrons in the superconductor via a scalar, you also find a screening effect. This is characterized by the polarization tensor. So how does, um, how does a theorist learn that a metal is shiny? Theorist learns the metal is shiny by computing the polarization tensor of a metal and finding that that polarization tensor is large. So um, just as you do in QED, that polarization tensor relates the current uh, to the field. And the two point of that uh, current uh, is that polarization tensor. And so that uh, now in a, in a model where you have the uh, photon and the dark photon, and there's a kinetic mixing term, which has been removed here by, by making a rotation. That's why uh, F has been related replaced by F tilde. 
And what that does is to give rise to a mixing term between the photon and the dark photon via this polarization tensor. And so when you solve the equation of motion for the photon, um, you find that it induces an effective coupling of the dark photon to the electromagnetic current that goes like a ratio of the momentum transfer squared uh, over this, um, either the longitudinal, or the transverse polarization tensor. So here uh, I've written down the case for an isotropic material. It's a little bit more um, nuanced for an anisotropic material. You can find details in this, this paper, but the point that I wanna make is if this polarization tensor is large, you suppress the effective coupling of the dark matter to the electromagnetic current. And so you can uh, relate this polarization tensor via the equations of motion to the conductivity, and then by um, extension to the dielectric in the medium. And that dielectric, you can either uh, measure it, uh, typically the static dielectric, epsilon zero or epsilon infinity, if you want the generic epsilon of Q and omega, uh, you often have to calculate it. And the calculation that you do is very similar to the one that you do in QED, except the wave functions are not the, uh, you know, the QFT wave functions. They're the wave functions uh, that are relevant in the medium of interest. Um, and so that allows you to do a calculation of the polarization tensor. Uh, in a material like a superconductor, where the electrons are uh, free, at least electrons far from the Fermi uh, surface are free. And uh, that allows you to uh, compute the effective coupling, the effective propagator, which is going to be suppressed now by the dielectric, the in medium dielectric. And so if you calculate this uh, polarization tensor, the uh, numbers that come out for the superconductor um, are that uh, the value, the amplitude of this is on the order of uh, you know, 100 keV. And recall that uh, the typical momentum transfer is on the order of keV, or in the case of superconductors, even lower than that. And so this actually gives rise to a dramatic uh, many orders of magnitude suppression in the reach of uh, superconductors to, uh, to dark matter, uh, whether it's mediated by a dark photon, whether the interaction is mediated by a dark photon or by a scalar. And so one of the things that you think about is how do I reach such light dark matter uh, with a target that has a high uh, density of states high enough density of states, but also a weak optical response and a small gap so that the process is not kinematically forbidden. And uh, this is not impossible uh, for, um, for semiconductor-like materials, and these are called semi-metals. So uh, the band structure of you know, semiconductor-like materials can, it turns out, be quantum engineered. So condensed matter physicists, theorists in particular, have uh, the ability to uh, uh, compute the band structure of these materials using density functional theory and then to engineer them, engineer the electronic structure of these materials to look for the types of behaviors that we're interested in for dark matter detection. So for example, here's the material uh, ZRTE5. Uh, here again is a slice through the uh, Brewan zone. Uh, here's the Fermi energy. And the thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that away from the Fermi energy, this material looks um, very uh, semiconductor-like, but they have this unique feature where there is a band that uh, crosses this Fermi energy. And at that point, the density of states goes to a, a, a point, this, this structure here, I uh, probably should have zoomed in on it, but you can see that it has a cone-like behavior. The dispersion there is linear, so it looks like a relativistic dispersion. And um, as a result, the optical response of this material 
uh, is, rel is very weak in comparison to an ordinary metal. And so if you compute the reach to the dark matter interaction cross-section as a function of the, the dark matter mass, you find that if you compare a superconductor, which is shown here in black, so again here, this now is starting just at 1 MeV and extends down to 1 keV, you'll see that it uh, the um, semi-metal with this unique band structure near the Fermi surface performs very well in comparison to the superconductor. So this is an example of where you really need to pay attention to some of the detailed uh, electronic structure of these materials to be able to reach lighter dark matter candidates. This, however, electron exc excitations is not the focus of this talk. I want to discuss again, uh, instead, collective modes. So uh, why are we interested in collective modes? First of all, what are collective modes? And secondly, why are we interested in them? And uh, there is this basic physical fact that the typical interparticle spacing in materials is about an inverse KEV. So once the, the momentum transfer in the process drops below a KEV, um, the de Broglie wavelength uh, of the associated with the momentum transfer becomes longer than the typical interparticle spacing in materials. So that auto automatically tells you um, that the relevant degrees of freedom in the target aren't individual nuclei or ions. Instead, what we should do is to coarse grain our theory and uh, describe the dark matter couplings to these collective excitations. So collective excitations are uh, either phonon modes or spin waves, which are known as magnons. And I'll have um, a picture to illustrate uh, what those are in just a bit. And this is a very uh, general concept. It applies to just about any material. Uh, but of course, the details depend on the nature of the collective modes and the target material and uh, the nature of the dark matter coupling to the target. So this KEV momentum transfer, so MEV mass dark matter, because the dark matter velocity is on the order of 10 to the minus three times C is on the order of KEV. So that's what um, that mass, MEV mass, is what generically uh, demarcates where uh, collective excitations will always be relevant for dark matter interactions. That said, especially for certain mediator types, even for dark matter with mass above an MEV, collective excitations can be highly relevant for dark matter detection. And we'll see that in just a little bit. So let me spend some time on the uh, mechanics of how this works. So the overarching goal uh, in looking for a material with strong uh, interactions with dark matter is to find a material with a strong dynamic structure factor in the kinematic region which overlaps with dark matter. So a dynamic structure factor is um, a bread and butter object in uh, condensed matter physics and material science that at least uh, I didn't know <laughs> was a, a, a uh, technical object. So this is kind of the keys to the kingdom. You can ask any condensed matter theorist or material scientist for the dynamic structure factor as a, a function of Q and omega, and you can almost immediately get uh, much of the information that you need. So the dark matter rate then is going to come from computing the interaction rate at a given velocity. So dark matter comes in with some velocity and momentum, and it uh, deposits some momentum Q and energy omega onto the crystal lattice, which makes a transition from some initial to final state. So I'm setting this up as a quantum mechanics problem. And to get the total rate, I need to integrate over the velocity distribution. And then, uh, and then I need to uh, weight by the dark matter density. And this is a convention that uh, gives me the rate per unit mass. 
Now this uh, dark matter interaction rate at the given velocity uh, depends on integrating this dynamic structure factor, which characterizes the material, the target material, folding that with uh, a dark matter form factor, which tells you about the nature of the medi mediator. Is it, for example, is it a massless mediator or a massive mediator? What is the mass of that mediator? So there's a momentum dependence that enters in this dark matter form factor that multiplies the target properties and then finally, there's an overall normalization um, that's fixed by my definition of uh, the, the dark matter form factor. And then of course I have to integrate over the phase space. Now this is a quantum mechanical uh, object and uh, it's computed by taking the initial state of your target uh, and the final state and tabulating the lattice potential that the invert that the incoming dark matter sees, and then uh, applying Fermi's golden rule to get this dynamic structure factor. So this is a, an object that uh, appears in many contexts. And so at the end of the day, uh, um, we're going to be interested in tabulating this dynamic structure factor for a wide range of types of dark matter interactions. So we need to be able to characterize um, this matrix element. And uh, the uh, um, involved part of the calculation uh, um, requires that we take the lattice degrees of freedom, that we quantize those lattice degrees of freedom, and then we uh, write down the lattice potential that results. And as I said before, the types of collectic collective excitations that we're interested in are uh, either phonons or magnons. So phonons are quite literally just lattice vibrations. So let me show this again. So dark matter comes in, it interacts with one of these uh, ions. And then when it does that, it induces either a vibration in the lattice or, uh, or um, a precession of the spins, uh, which are magnons. Now, uh, this, of course, is a dramatic simplification of the actual uh, calculations. There are different varieties of phonons. So, for example, if I have a unit cell with um, two different types of ion ions, for example, gallium arsenide is probably the simplest examples of this. I can have those ions in the unit cell oscillate in phase. Uh, that's known as an acoustic phonon, or I can have them oscillate out of phase, and that is uh, an optical phonon. As I said before, the real situation is much more complicated. Uh, these ions now exist within a larger unit cell, or I can go to much more complicated um, unit cells, for example, sapphire, which consists of two um, uh, aluminum ions, along with actually six uh, oxygen uh, ions. Um, Al2O3, so there are uh, 10 actual ions in the unit cells. And so uh, what needs to be done here is to compute the uh, oscillators. So to, it's, it becomes an eigenvalue problem um, that is typically computed with density functional theory. I'm going to focus on the dark matter uh, side of this and how uh, to characterize the coupling to those modes in the material. And since this is all things EFT, uh, I want to describe, you know, where is EFT entering here? And it's really in two places. There are two matchings that are happening here. So the first one is that we need to match the relativistic operators of my uh, UV complete theory onto the non relativistic operators. And um, this is something that had been done in the literature prior to us. I'll, I'll briefly uh, touch on that. So the idea here is that you take your relativistic states and you just uh, expand them in uh, powers of the momentum transfer over the fermion or scalar mass of interest. So the, uh, and then keep the leading order in that expansion. So there are two types of uh, momenta that enter. One is Q on uh, the fermion mass. And because the um, target uh, fermions at, and the dark matter as well are not at rest, we also need to define um, a V perp, 
which depends on um, not just the dark matter velocity and the momentum transfer, but also the uh, the sum, the the um, velo say the initial velocity of the target electron or the initial velocity of the dark matter. So we need to keep this additional term, uh, which means that we have both v perf and q on m psi. Then there's a second type of matching that needs to uh, happen. We need to match those non-relativistic operators onto the lattice degrees of freedom. So the lattice degrees of freedom are uh, the displacements of uh, ion J in unit cell L from the equilibrium value. And this is quantized. So we have phonon uh, annihilation and creation operators. You can see um, that there's a polarization vector. So these are the eigenvectors of the um, modes of this um, coupled uh, set of ions. And then it has some normalization that depends on the unit cell and the energy of those modes. So this is the, the basic uh, uh, quantum mechanical uh, operator that uh, characterizes the excitation of these phonon modes. And then uh, once you've done these matchings, then the final set uh, step is just to compute the dark matter excitation rates using Fermi Gold, Fermi's golden rule, integrating over both the momentum and the velocity distribution of the dark matter. Uh, and I would like to make one more comment here, which is how is it that you know that your um, effective theory describing those lattice degrees of freedom is breaking down? And it turns out that the theory does this automatically for you. You um, expand uh, the displacements in the, uh, uh, in the exponential, and you use uh, Baker Campbell Hausdorff, and that gives you uh, um, exponentials of those uh, creation and annihilation operators, moving those through gives you an e to the minus uh, w factor that depends now on the coefficients of those creation and annihilation operators. And the point that I wanna make here is that once the momentum transfer becomes large enough, um, which is when you would expect eventually those, you would start seeing uh, the individual um, nuclei, individual atoms, individual ions, uh, then you get a suppression in this rate. Uh, so this calculation takes that into account for you uh, automatically. So let's go through the, the steps of how this work works, starting first with the match of this relativistic operators onto the non-relativistic operators. So what you need to do is to, uh, for a given dark matter, you I've, it's written down here for uh, fermionic dark matter, but it's a simple extension to do scalar dark matter. And you write down the cup, all the possible couplings to uh, the ions consistent with uh, Lorentz invariants uh, at a given dimension. So uh, these can be classified according to the standard spin independent and spin dependent, the type of the scalar mediator, um, and then there are uh, multiple dark matter models um, that appear. And then finally, this what we call L dot S interacting, which is a rather awkward model to UV complete, but for the purpose of being complete. Uh, also, because it's the operator, you get this unique L cross S response, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So you do this non-relativistic reduction. Um, this decomposition was carried out here using the non-relativistic basis that had been um, proposed in, in this paper here. And you end up with some non-relativistic uh, EFT uh, with um, these coefficients of the operator basis, which I'll write down what the operators are uh, a little bit later on, but suffice it to say that that now we have a, a basis of operators through this non-relativistic decomposition. So um, before we go on to describing some of the more involved cases, I'm going to start simple with the standard spin, inter spin, inter spin independent interactions to understand how this type of calculation goes in more detail. So uh, let's take a simple material to start with. 
gallium arsenide. So um, each unit cell has two ions. And the number of collective modes is just uh, three times the number of the ions in the unit cell. So in every material, uh, you have three of those modes that have a massless uh, dispersion. That is to say, at zero momentum transfer near the gamma point, they have zero energy. And uh, that's just associated with, uh, because these guys are Goldstone bosons. So every material has three acoustic modes, two of them are transverse, one is longitudinal, and the remaining modes are gapped. And those gapped modes are known as optical modes. The reason why they're called optical modes is in a, in a polar material, say like gallium arsenide, those optical modes are the ones that oscillate out of phase. And uh, so what they do, because they're ions, uh, is that sets up a, a, an oscillating dipole. And that oscillating dipole couples well to um, a photon, uh, unlike the um, acoustic modes, which have their coupling to the photon suppressed by the fact that they oscillate in, in phase. Now, even materials like uh, silicon, uh, which do not have these strong uh, oscillating dipoles, those, uh, it's not a polar material. Nevertheless, those gap modes are always called optical modes. So these general principles that I've just applied, just described apply to more complicated materials. So sapphire is a material with uh, two Al2O3. So it has 10 ions in the unit cell. It has 30 total modes. Again, three of those modes are the acoustic, the gapless modes. And then you have the 27 uh, quote unquote optical modes, although not all of them couple strongly to, uh, to the photon. And so uh, you need to compute the effective coupling uh, to these resonances in the material. So obviously uh, you need to have a good kinematic match between the dark matter and these resonances in order to get a large response in the material. And so uh, I can state this in a pretty uh, trivial way now that uh, a good rule of thumb for understanding whether you have uh, a good kinematic match between the dark matter and the target material is to look at where the dark matter uh, kinematics uh, dispersion lies in uh, this um, dispersion plot. So dark matter has a velocity which is large in comparison to the typical speed of sound in materials. The speed of sound is what sets the slope of the um, acoustic phonon dispersions. So in a typical material, the speed of sound is not higher than about 10 to the minus five times C. Dark matter velocity, on the other hand, is 10 to the minus three times C. So that tells you that dark matter carries a lot of energy relative to typical phonon modes. Uh, and so as a result, dark matter typically couples better to gapped modes. The actual situation, of course, involves um, integrals over phase space, and it's more nuanced than that, but this is a, a rule of thumb to start with. So uh, let's go through this process for the standard spin independent interactions. Matching the relativistic operators onto the non-relativistic operators is very simple. It just involves one operator with uh, one coefficient, C sub one. Um, and then you need to match those non-relativistic operators onto the lattice degrees of freedom. Now for a simple enough material, let's say gallium arsenide, is my simple material. This is provided by uh, a Froelich Hamiltonian. So there's a simple analytic uh, Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian that I can use to write down the effective um, coupling of the dark matter to the lattice degrees of freedom. And then because in a material like gallium arsenide, uh, the phonon dispersions have simple analytic expressions, uh, I can go ahead and um, compute the uh, excitation rates, which at that point um, involves uh, a six dimensional integral over um, the velocity and the momentum transfer, which can actually be simplified um, using the delta functions available to you in the isotropy of the material. So let me be more concrete. 
Uh, the Froelich Hamiltonian says that uh, I'm going to create a phonon uh, of momentum Q and uh, annihilate a dark matter particle with momentum K and create one with momentum K minus Q. And uh, the strength of that is going to be one on Q um, because as I said before, the physics of this is of an oscillating dipole. And then there's an effective uh, coupling constant, which uh, I'm not going to derive here uh, right away. Um, it depends on the energy of the optical uh, phonon modes and then the, di the, uh, the dielectric epsilon infinity and epsilon naught. And the matrix element then can be computed from this Hamiltonian. Kappa here is um, a kinetic mixing parameter. And so you can see that it just gives you the potential that you would expect from uh, an oscillating dipole with an effective coupling constant then that depends on the electronic structure of the material. Then you just go ahead and apply Fermi's golden rule to this uh, by integrating in this case over the final state uh, dark matter momenta and then that allows you to obtain a total rate. And so when you go through these steps, you can see now for this particular case, the calculation, uh, once you understand what to do, is quite simple um, because there are these analytic expressions and it allows you to compute a reach for dark matter interaction cross-section as a function of dark matter mass. Uh, and here again is the 1 GeV range. Uh, scintillator um, would correspond to uh, uh, let's say gallium arsenide is a kind of scintillator. So you could have electron excitation. So the physics that's going on here is you have electron excitation. This is turning up here. Once the dark matter kinetic energy drops below the gap of the semiconductor. And then here, what we showed is that, uh, that um, gallium arsenide, the phonon modes now can kick in and have strong sensitivity to light dark matter. Here is this Dirac material, ZRTE5, that I mentioned earlier. Um, it turns out that this curve needed to be corrected uh, um, by in medium effects. And so it's actually about two orders of magnitude weaker. But I just want to emphasize that this is, this is uh, the phonon reach curve here. So, so this was an effective interaction that I just wrote down. You'd like to be able to do this calculation from first principles. Uh, after all, this is a seminar on all things EFT. So let me show you how that goes in just a little bit more detail. So the um, effective description that we're interested in is to take the material in its ground state that's noted by the zero and to calculate the excitation of phonon branch nu having momentum K via a potential that's induced by the dark matter interaction, transferring some momentum uh, with a dark matter having a velocity V. And so what you do is to say, okay, that potential is gonna be the sum of the potential on all the lattice sites. Uh, and then I'm gonna have a phase factor e to the i q dot x. And that phase factor is now the thing that is going to be quantized in terms of the lattice displacements which uh, create the phonons. And so this is an expression that I showed before uh, where I write down the eigenvectors of those phonon modes um, multiplied by uh, these uh, uh, e to the i k dot x with the equilibrium position. And then you can uh, plug this in here uh, and um, it gives you an expression for um, the lattice potential to create a single phonon that um, has this form with, again, this um, exponential factor that tells you at high enough momentum transfer uh, that you expect this, um, uh, this calculation to uh, be, this rate to be highly suppressed. And then there's a, um, always a dot product between the momentum transfer and these polarization vectors of the phonons. And uh, so from that, using Fermi's golden rule, you can calculate the interaction rate that now uh, takes on uh, this form, where now the uh, 
um, momentum transfer has been replaced um, by a, a lattice vector. Uh, and uh, otherwise, the form of this should look uh, familiar, or at least somewhat familiar. Uh, and then I just want to note that the Froelich Hamiltonian is obtained in a limit that you uh, that this Debye Waller factor is zero, that um, we're not moving from one Brillouin zone to another, g equals zero, where the lattice potential is what's appropriate for an oscillating dipole. And that in the limit that I have these two ions um, oscillating directly out of phase. So the, the um, optical polarization vectors are anti-parallel. So you can uh, take this first principles calculation, take the relevant limit, and you reproduce the, the uh, Froelich Hamiltonian that we saw earlier. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the next uh, couple of slides and just show you um, the results. So here we're covering from 10 GeV. So this is where the WIMP experiments die, <laughs> all the way down to the warm dark matter limit at a KeV. And uh, these solid curves correspond to electronic excitation in semiconductors. And uh, the dash curves are uh, single phonon production calculated through these uh, methods that I described on the previous slides for various types of materials. And uh, I should note that this is a one kilogram year, one kilogram year. So these are very small exposures relative to these big, uh, you know, xenon one ton type experiments. And you can see that they cover, for example, this freeze in line by uh, many orders of magnitude. So you really need very modest exposures to be able to cover um, these regions which are motivated by the dark matter relative density being set by its interaction with the standard model. So now we want to generalize this um, lattice, uh, uh, lattice uh, theory that we've developed to being able to cover uh, a broader range of interactions other than standard spin independent interactions. And that's where this non relativistic decomposition uh, uh, comes into play. And as a specific example, I'm going to focus on the um, multiple dark matter as an illustration of this calculation. So each one of these coefficients corresponds to a non-relativistic operator in the basis, which uh, we characterize in terms of whether it couples to charge or spin, and whether it's independent or dependent on V perpendicular, with, which you'll recall depended not only on the momentum transfer in the, in the dark matter velocity, but also depends on um, the uh, target um, uh, momentum. So these operators now allow you to write down a complete expression for this lattice potential in terms of the coefficients of this operator. Uh, I'm not, it, it's a mess. <laughs> the result is written down um, in this paper, but uh, the full form is a mess. But of course, each relativistic operator only picks out a few of these uh, non-relativistic operators. So now what do you do? Uh, let's just pick up a specific example because the full potential is uh, overwhelming. So let's just uh, pick up one operator of each type. Okay, so there's four different types of operators. Let's pick up one operator of each type. So C1, C4, C8, and C3. So um, these two, C4 and C8 are the spin dependent ones, depend on the dark matter uh, spin. And then we have these, um, which are not dependent on the dark matter spin. So um, this one is just the ordinary spin independent. And this is just the ordinary spin dependent interaction. Then we have these two terms on the bottom line. Those are a little bit more interesting. And I want to highlight that uh, what they, uh, one of the reasons why they're interesting is that they pull out a new type of response. 
And that depends on the angular momentum of the um, electrons in the target material or uh, a, a product of the angular momentum and the spin of those electrons. And these terms that depend on the angular momentum uh, are actually derived, again, I don't have time to go into details, from, uh, the, from this VPERP operator, which is coming from um, a derivative on the electron wave functions. So let's um, cut to the chase. And uh, since I haven't said it yet, uh, the responses that are induced by these non-relativistic operators are point-like responses, which are coupling to a charge or to the spin. But then there are also what we call these composite response. And the reason why we call them a composite response is because they're dependent on the uh, electronic structure in a given ion. So that's what generates this angular momentum or the, or the angular momentum times the spin. And so um, to couple to either the spin or to the angular momentum, you need for uh, a unit cell to have a net spin or angular momentum to couple to. And so when you calculate the potential for these uh, ionic, for the ionic potential, it's going to depend on the ability of this uh, spin to actually uh, create an excitation. And uh, so it turns out that you're able to compute over a given unit cell, the expectation value of the uh, uh, spin or angular momentum so uh, bottom line, you need a magnetic material to be able to do that. So typical semiconductors or polar materials are not magnetic materials, but we do have some good examples of magnetic materials. For example, YIG, yttrium ion garnet is an example um, where the uh, iron ions have, uh, is an antiferometric. So these guys line up and you have a uh, and you have a net spin within the unit cell. And then we also have an example of a material with uh, a non-zero angular momentum in these materials that are called Mott insulators. So in the interest of time, um, I'm uh, going to uh, now give you the results, focusing, as I said before, on uh, the multiple case projecting these relativistic operators onto the non-relativistic basis. So there are a few things I'd like to highlight. All of these UV complete operators have the um, spin independent response. So, um, uh, and they also have the spin, <laughs> uh, but I'd like to emphasize that ordinary uh, polar materials will couple to these more exotic types of interactions. Now they will couple with an, a reduced rate. So the dependence on the product of the couplings is a function of the dark matter mass. Um, so here is the sensitivity for a typical spin independent interaction. And you can see that the electric dipole and the magnetic dipole and the antipole are all weaker. And that just has to do with the fact that these operators are uh, suppressed by powers of momentum relative to the leading spin independent interaction. So if a spin independent interaction is available to you, of course, that will be the dominant one. But of course, in some models, it may be the case that the dark matter has only a dipole moment that will allow it to couple uh, to the mediator uh, and then onto the standard model. Uh, then um, you can compare the reach via um, the, uh, uh, the N uh, interaction to the one that um, comes from spin or angular momentum. Uh, and the coupling to the spin and the angular momentum in these spin dependent operators is stronger. So if I compare the reach uh, via phonons with the N interaction to the reach via the spin or the angular momentum. So the uh, magnetic material YIG 
has only the S response, the more exotic Kataev material, which um, we've uh, chosen is alpha RUCL3. It's kind of an exotic material, but we chose it because it has a large angular momentum response. You can see that, in fact, it does have a better reach for the magnetic and, and, and magnetic dipole and the antipole relative to uh, relative to the um, uh, to the polar materials, so to the phonon reach. Uh, that said, uh, a realistic detector using YIG or a Kataev material is much farther into the future. In fact, as I'll highlight briefly, uh, these um, experiments that are going to use phonons uh, with a polar material target are already funded and in an R&D phase. So you can see that um, still will have a broad coverage to models. So before I um, conclude, there is one additional point that I'd like to emphasize that is a really cool feature of these uh, materials is that because these materials are crystal lattices, they're not isotropic. And um, so that means that the oscillator strength is going to depend on the direction of the momentum transfer. And therefore, by extension, is going to depend on the direction of the incoming dark matter particle. Now, the dark matter uh, detector is going to be on the surface of the Earth. The Earth has an orientation with respect to the dark matter wind. So this, the dark matter wind is towards Cygnus. That direction of the dark matter wind is just set by the movement of the Earth around the sun and then the sun around the center of the galaxy. The relevant thing here is that as a function of the time of day, uh, the axis, uh, the dark matter detector is going to rotate with respect to the dark matter wind. So the uh, incoming dark matter direction is going to change. And so therefore, the oscillator strengths are going to be dependent on the time of the day. So here's a little animation that you can see that the way that these modes, so here's one particular optical mode, the way that these modes are excited depends on uh, the uh, direction in which dark matter will come in and interact with uh, with the target material. So this is sapphire AL203, and there's two in the unit cell. So that actually gives rise to a variation in the rate uh, in comparison to the average rate. And it is an order one variation. So this is a smoking gun signature. And furthermore, you can orient the detector with respect to the dark matter wind in different ways. So. Uh, it would allow you to test the hypothesis that uh, your uh, signal was coming from a dark matter interaction. And so one of the things that we're working out is doing a comparison of different materials uh, and how large of an interaction cross-section that you'll need in order to have a statistically significant daily modulation. Um, and so that's, that's what's shown here. This is for, again, kilogram year type exposures in the detector. Uh, and you can see that, you know, if dark matter were produced by Friesen, um, it would be pretty straightforward to uh, see this, this type of a, a signal. So before I conclude, uh, I would just like to say that all of these ideas um, that I've talked about now are pretty developed and are becoming experiments, funded experiments. And so you need to have sensitivity to single optical phonons. So depending on the material type, that means you need some, somewhere between 10 and 100 millib uh, energy resolution, um, which is below current sensitivity, but not that far below. Uh, and then you're going to, of course, have to reduce the uh, dark counts, the backgrounds in these experiments, to reach comparable levels to where the uh, WIMP experiments are. But as I said before, these are now funded by DOE. Uh, and there's a, um, a form of this for a polar crystal target. And the name of that experiment is the sub-EV polar interactions cryogenic experiment. There was a letter um, of interest submitted to SNOMAS. I'm, I'm part of this uh, effort as the lone uh, 
theorist, but you can take a look at this if you want to learn more about the experimental efforts. Just as a summary, uh, collective excitations for sub-GEV dark matter do provide a novel path to detect theoretically relevant and interesting light dark matter candidates. There's now a theory framework that's quite well developed for computing those dark matter interactions rates in the materials. And we have now new experiments such as SPICE that have a broad discovery potential for these dark matter candidates. So thank you and I'm going to stop there. <laughs>